Hi, I'm Heather Rodriguez. I'm a natural fertility specialist, and my team and I help couples who are preparing for conception, preparing for pregnancy, or medical fertility treatments. And today's fertility scope is going to be about uterine fibroids and natural um, therapies and options that are out there. And today's class, it's kind of funny. I've had this uterus for so long, and I was excited that I get to finally use it. So. <laughs> So you won't see any of my stick drawings today. I actually have a diagram I'm gonna use for you. So this class is a much requested one. So I was like, all right, I'm bringing the fibroid class to you guys. And this is gonna be helpful for a lot of different people, even if you do not have uh, fibroids, because we are going to talk a lot about estrogen metabolism and how to affect that through diet as well. Man, I'm maybe if I turn this way. Naturalfertilityshop.com, yes. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and jump in and get started. So I'm just kinda of gonna go over like fibroids 101 just real quick so we can kinda of get on the same page of what I'm, what I'm talking about and referring to. So here's Miss Uterus. She is a very sad uterus because she happens to have every single uterine issue possible all at once. <laughs> so this is used for education. Um, no one's, hopefully no one's uterus would ever have all these issues going on. But as you can see, these are going to be um, the ovaries, these are the fallopian tubes, and then this is the uterus, and the cervix would be right down here, and this is the vaginal canal, okay? So we kind of know our location and our real estate here. Um, so when it comes to fibroids, there's actually a couple, there's a couple different types depending on where the location is. On this, um, on this gal, we've got uh, submucosal, which means it's between the layers of the muscle, like this is the lining of the uterus, and then this is within the muscle. And then this is a, um, uh, pendu, uh, pendu, pendunculated. So it means it's hanging off of like a little, um, a little neck or a little kind of tendon here into the uterus. And there's a couple different types. There's some that can be attached to the outside and be hanging over the fallopian tubes and causing issues there. Um, there's some that can be on the outside. Um, but a lot of cases they're growing within the muscle or within the uterine cavity. Those are the ones that are going to affect fertility more so. Well, if they're hanging off of the um, fallopian tube, they definitely will as well. So that's just kind of a little visual for you guys. Um, there's a, lot, a couple other issues like these little dots. This is going to be uh, endometriosis, um, you know, a couple different things going on with this gal. And this is scar tissue on the fallopian tubes. But we're talking about uterine fibroids today, okay? So these guys. So the thing with uterine fibroids is that they're hormonal dependent. They are so responsive to hormones. Um, the women are getting these during the hormonal, the strongest hormonal time of their lives, which happens to be during the fertility phase of your life. So they have, fibroid tissues have more estrogen and progesterone receptor sites than any other tissue found in the body. And they're extremely sensitive to those being triggered. And also, obviously, since it's just a tissue in the body, it does not have the ability to metabolize or respond um, to that estrogen. So it has more receptor sites for both uh, progesterone and estrogen, mostly estrogen, and it also cannot metabolize or control the reaction to that. So it's constantly being triggered. And the thing with estrogen is estrogen, um, one of the amazing things about estrogen is it causes things to grow in the body. And most of the times this is supposed to be good. This is what grows our uterine lining. This is what's going to help to stimulate um, and mature um, our follicles, etc. There's so many different things happening because of estrogen. So estrogen's not evil. It's just when there's too much of a good thing, right? Um, so in the case of uterine fibroids, they're going to be fluctuating also with the monthly cycle for some people. So a lot of people who have uterine fibroids have tiny, might have a tiny little fibroid, and that's actually not gonna be a big deal for most people. They generally go away on their own. So keep that in mind. Just because you might have uterine fibroids doesn't mean like, you know, it's this huge dramatic thing you need to freak out about. Um, but it depends on the size and the location. So that's where it can kind of get into um, some trouble. So, because some of them can grow quite large. You know, I've heard of, Man, this little hair, I'm trying not to be distracted, but this little hair is bugging the heck out of me. Um, stop looking at myself. Um, so, you know, I've heard of some that were size of softballs that, that had to be removed, some, you know, some that are even larger, grapefruit. There's kind of references to the larger fruit <laughs> to say the size of them. So they can get quite large and they can definitely cause issues once they're getting that large. Um, how they affect fertility is they can affect implantation. Um, they can compress on fallopian tubes like I was talking about before. If it's like attached to the top of the uterus, um, it can just squish the fallopian tube, um, preventing ovulation from uh, the egg from moving and meeting up with the sperm. Um, and from the 
again, the sperm being able to fertilize. Also, it's going to reduce uh, uterine blood flow, which is pretty big deal. Um, um, in turn, that can possibly cause miscarriage, premature rupture of the membranes, which means you go into labor way too early. Um, so there's a couple different, you know, factors to consider with it. Does not mean all these things are going to happen to you if you have fibroids. These are just kind of what the extreme cases um, or dangers of having fibroids is. Um, and unfortunately, our, our African-American sisters are two to three times more likely to have uterine fibroids. Um, I don't know why that is, but statistically, that's kind of the data that's been pulled. Um, so there's a couple different options for them. Yeah, <laughs> Tiffany can speak to that. A um, couple different options. So there's obviously, you can have surgery. There's surgery where you can directly move the fibroid. Um, also, some doctors recommend hysterectomy. So let's just get rid of that uterus. She's malfunctioning. We'll just get rid of her. Um, don't get me started in hysterectomies. Um, so those are kind of the, you know, there's some other surgical procedures, but surgery is, you know, is kind of one option. And there is, you know, there is a place for it. It's not automatically don't ever get surgery. I mean, there's a certain, I think a certain point where the fibroids get so large that surgery is something to think about, but it's not necessarily the go-to when you have small ones or ones that are fluctuating, which most people have. But when there's a larger one, like say it's grapefruit or getting larger than that, um, because of the monthly cycle, there's not going to be enough time for it to, um, to shrink small enough. So it's just something to consider. Uh, we're not automatically be like, oh, surgery is bad, but it doesn't have to be your first go-to. Um, all right. So I'm going to now go into what natural factors can help to, um, to support you. And something to think about the, the surgery. And this is what's so unfortunate is you can have the surgery, but they can still grow back. It does not prevent them from growing back. Um, give me just just one quick second. Sorry about that. <laughs> so only lifestyle factors are going to make a difference of them growing back. So even if you end up um, doing the surgery, you need to look at these factors that I'm talking about, uh, regardless of what route you're going. But this is what we use to help to support our um, our clients to support their body with, you know, helping to balance out everything. So there's going to be a couple different steps. So step one. My goodness, I'm sorry guys, this is just driving the jumpers out of me. Okay, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> I was getting distracted, I could not focus. All right, better, let's go. Okay. <laughs> well, when you're, when you're scoping, all you see is like yourself, you know, in the comments that are just like going nuts here. Okay, so step one is going to be cleanse reduce your exposure to uh, xenoestrogens and promote healthy estrogen metabolism. So it's kind of a threefold situation there. So the first is going to be cleansing. Um, cleansing is where I start a lot of people um, with what's going on with them because so much is hormonally based. And so <laughs> I know it drives me crazy. So, so much of it's hormonally based, like what we're talking about. So fertility cleansing is, is such a great place to start. It's going to help to support the liver. The liver's main job is to help to metabolize um, excess hormones in the system. It's going to help increase circulation to the uterus with what you just talked about. That's going to be really helpful. Um, so that's the first step. The next step that I generally go to is to reduce exposure to xenoestrogens. So there's a lot of xenoestrogens or hormonal disruptors. There's a lot of terms that you can uh, use for it in our environment. So um, a quick list for that because I could do a whole class on that. I've done a couple of these past couple of weeks um, is first to eat organic food. That's going to make such a huge difference. Pesticides that are on produce mimic estrogens. Um, animals are given more estrogen so they can produce more milk, grow bigger. Um, so there's a lot of these uh, hormones in our food system. So eating organic. The next is going to be reducing your exposure to pesticides, fertilizers, herbicides, etc. Um, using natural feminine care products. This is going to be what you use as tampons, what you use as pads. Um, there's cotton is one of the most sprayed chemicals. There's a lot of other chemicals put into the product, but there's natural alternatives. Just get your tampons and your pads or whatever at the health food store. Um, there's definitely safe alternatives for that. And also, I'm not a big proponent of using tampons all the time, all, um, all cycle long. Like if you need to go work out or you need to go swimming, then that's fine, but I don't think it's something when you're going through fertility issues such as fibers and endometriosis um, to use tampons. I think pads are a better call because the tissues are, anyways, yeah. So I think it's a better call. <laughs> I'm not going to go into tampons right now. Um, avoiding food preservatives and dyes, using VOC paints, um, 
And also avoiding plastics. I think avoiding plastics is one of the easiest and most effective things you can do, especially the squishy, um, I don't have any, but the squishy water bottles that crinkle um, that you leave in your hot car and then you're drinking, that's definitely, those are very leachy, they're very porous, so that, that's going into the water when it's heated. Um, and another thing is skincare. There are so many different plastics and hormonal disruptors in skincare. A lot of different studies have shown much of the um, parabens, um, a lot of the things in sunblock, my class that I did, yeah, I don't think it's going to be up actually. Um, anyways, there's a lot of different things in skincare. So skincare is something to look at because a lot of those ingredients are mimicking estrogen. Two shops I have found that I really like is going to be um, Chic and Safe and Citron Beauty, I think it's called. Citrine Beauty, something like that. So those are a couple stores that you can go to and know that every single, single thing that's in there has been vetted for you for those types of ingredients such as parabens, um, because there's a lot of people who have a lot of different health issues that they're finding when they switch their skincare, and it actually is making a really big difference. There's been two huge brands that have been created from women who had um, lupus and celiac disease and all these different things that when they actually switched their skincare, that was one of the biggest factors that made a change for them. I just find that so interesting. So we have a lot of really great alternatives now. Um, so that's another thing to look at, especially because we're putting it on our skin. Our skin absorbs 60% of everything put on it and we're doing that day in, day out. So those are like my quick tips for reducing your exposure to um, xenoestrogens. Another thing is going to be looking at diet. So I'm gonna give you some diet tips for helping to support a body that's um, experiencing uterine fibroids. So a whole food diet, of course, is going to be the basis. Whole food diet, fresh things from the earth. If it grows on the earth, eat it. Um, but if you aren't, like when I go into the herbs and supplements, they aren't gonna work as well if you do not address diet. Diet has a big impact, just like I was talking about skincare does. If you're put, you know, making sure to eat organics, you're not putting additional um, hormones and everything. Thank you guys so much for the hearts. Um, we're not eating additional. And then also eating a whole food diet. So a diet that's going to naturally be rich in fiber. And fiber is like, one, it's practically free, right? I mean, it's in vegetables, it's in beans, it's in grains, um, it's in all, all kinds of foods. That is going to help to get rid of the excess estrogens in your system. So making sure to eat a high fiber diet. I know someone's probably going to ask, what about a fiber supplement? I would rather you get it from diet because fiber supplements can end up being a little bit harsh for some people and it's so easy to get from your diet. If you're eating beans, eat lentils. One servings of lentils a day is all the folate, folate you need when you're preparing for conception. Dark leafy green vegetables have tons of fiber, so I'd rather you get it from diet because you're going to get other beneficial things from doing that. Um, um, good sources of fiber. Deep, dark leafy green vegetables, yep, yeah, brown rice, oats, broccoli, Swiss chard, quinoa, chia seeds, flax, ground seeds, um, whole grains, and beans. Those are all really, really rich in fiber. Also, avoid refried grains, uh, avoid white bread, anything basically white. Um, yeah, anything refined. So you want to do the whole grain options, like Ezekiel, switch out for Ezekiel bread. If you're not used to it, it will take a little while to get used to the flavor of Ezekiel. But start with the raisin cinnamon one. I make sandwiches with the raisin cinnamon one because I just I think it's good. Um, also, just avoiding the anti-nutrients. So avoiding alcohol, avoiding caffeine. Um, you know, it's kind of hard. Like, yes, once in a while, you know, have a drink. Once in a while, do these things. But it's just day in, day out if you're drinking a lot of caffeine or you're doing um, drinking a lot, you know, every single day. Cutting back on that, making changes for that. Um, okay, so now we're going to go into how to support healthy estrogen metabolism. So psyllium I consider to be a fiber supplement that I actually wouldn't suggest. I would, I would still suggest to get it all through diet. So for instance, if you're making fertility smoothies, add a huge Swiss chard leaf or add some kale or add some spinach to it. Um, it's just so easy to get fiber from your diet that I'd rather you focus on finding it in the foods that you're eating because you're going to naturally just eat so much better um, and be eating the foods that you should be eating anyways instead of focusing on doing a supplement. And psyllium, some people feel that psyllium actually scrapes the intestines and can be kind of harsh. Okay, so on to healthy, supporting healthy estrogen metabolism. Green juices are fantastic, but they're not going to have fiber in them. The fiber is taken out once you have juiced them. Um, so yes, this is helping with estrogen dominance. That's actually the entire focus of this. Um, and the real deal is always the best. And I'll go over herbs in just a second for, uh, for, for that person who was asking about teas. 
yeah, so the real deal is always going to be the best. I love juicing, I juice every day, but also it takes out the fiber. So I do a smoothie every day as well, and I'll put, um, I'll either put my leafy greens in there or I'll put fertility greens in there. Um, okay, so how to support healthy estrogen metabolism. And again, this is useful for uterine fibroids and a lot of other fertility issues that are estrogen dominant, but uterine fibroids specifically, because we want to reduce um, the amount of estrogen in the system. Thank you for sharing, Tiffany. Uh, because the tissue that makes up uterine fibroids is very uh, hypersensitive to estrogen because it has more receptor sites for estrogen than any other tissue in the body. Okay, so that's why we're focusing so much on estrogen. All right, so um, one supplement that's fantastic is going to be DIM, D-I-M. DIM is a compound that's found in cruciferous vegetables. It's found in kale, broccoli, cauliflower. I oh, know, I don't think cauliflower is cruciferous vegetable kale, um, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. That's what I meant, cabbage. And it has a compound that actually helps the body to get rid of bad estrogens. And it's really amazing because if it's not going to just get rid of every single type of estrogen in your system, it's going to get the bad or the excess estrogens or the xenoestrogens out of your system. I just think that's amazing. Like the natural world is so incredible. There's so many um, different herbs and supplements and compounds that work in this way where they kind of know what to take out and, and how to keep balance. So anyways, so dim. DIM is fantastic for helping with estrogen metabolism. I do have to let you know when you start using DIM, um, some people, and this is going to get a little bit TMI, too much information, <laughs> some people's urine begins to stink. And it's kind of like when you eat asparagus or when you eat, you know, you're eating like really concentrated compound from broccoli. So just kind of think about that. No, it's perfectly fine. Also, the color sometimes can be very, very bright. Just go with it, just kind of a you know heads up. No, that's perfectly normal. Um, so now we're gonna go on to, to herbs. So when we're focusing on helping a body that is experiencing uterine fibroids, we're going to be approaching it from a different angle. Oh great, yeah, DIM is fantastic. It's one of our, it's one of our most popular products. Um, so what we're doing is we're not, when we're using natural therapies, we're not like, okay, we're, we're not attacking the fibroid, we're not focusing on the fibroid because we don't work with diseases. We don't work on um, those types of factors. When you're working with natural therapies, what we're doing is helping to support the body so the body's able to function and do what it needs. So I just want you guys to be clear on that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to want to help to support the body's natural detoxification process, its natural ability to break down and clear um, foreign tissues, also helping to stimulate um, circulation and get rid of excess hormones in the system. So that's the approach. Like where, yes, there's a fibroid over here, we're actually gonna be working in these other areas of the body. So naturally, cause this is the tip of the iceberg, naturally the body is going to be able to help to um, maintain and overcome that type of imbalance. So we're focusing on um, liver health, estrogen metabolism, circulation, um, all of that, okay? Um, so one product that we love is fibro defense. And this is to help promote healthy uterine tissues and healthy, healthy functioning of the uterus. So that's the approach because we're working on circulation, we're working on liver, we're working on hormonal metabolism. Um, another thing is, to, is fertility massage. Self-fertility massage is going to help clear congestion. It's going to help to increase circulation as well as castor oil packs. Those two always go really, really well together. Um, castor oil packs help to soften, increase circulation, increase detoxification, support the body and all of that. Um, so you could do a castor oil pack and then follow up with self-fertility massage. That's fantastic to do every night of the week, but I say a minimum of three nights a week. But if you can, it's a great ritual to do every night. Um, you learn self-fertility massage. I have a DVD. It's a technique that I, that I created called self-fertility massage. You do for yourself in your home. You can also go see a fertility massage therapist. You can go see a Mercier uh, practitioner. That's a type of fertility massage or, um, what are they called? Mind abdominal therapists. Those are massage therapists that work on the abdomen. Um, so there's a lot of different options for you if you want to go see someone or you can do it for yourself. Um, and then the last thing they possibly consider is systemic enzymes. Systemic enzymes are compounds that help to break down tissues and proteins within the body. Um, we use it for a lot of helping the body to break down a lot of different things such as scar tissue. Um, so that's something else to consider is systemic enzymes. So for a quick recap, um, there's a couple of different reasons that fibroids are happening. We're not sure on the exact cause or why it happens so much for African-American women. 
Um, but they are very sensitive to uh, estrogens as well as progesterones, but mostly we have excess estrogens in our environment. So some of the best ways, um, or some of the things that, that having uterine fibroids can impede fertility is going to be affecting fertilization, implantation, or traveling of the embryo. Uh, they can also affect um, the pregnancy because if there's a large fibroid in there, the placenta is attaching and growing, it can cause premature labor. So it's something, if you've got larger ones, it's something to think about, but these lifestyle changes that I covered are going to be great for you, period. There's no, there's no negative thing to making these lifestyle changes. Um, and they're very in line with our normal natural fertility diet. Um, I think that the fertility cleanse is step one. I do. I think fertility cleanse and then moving on to something like um, fibro defense or using the herbs that help to focus on liver circulation to the uterus. Um, and you have to look at the lifestyle factors I talked about as well as avoiding uh, xenoestrogens in, in your environment and in your life. Um, and then looking at diet, whole food diet, juicing, lots of veggies, lots of fruits, um, high fiber, all that stuff. And then self-fertility massage, castor oil packs, and systemic enzymes. All right, thank you guys so much. Have a fantastic day. Oh yeah, I'll be on, I do a Q&A at least once a week. So I will definitely be on um, almost every single day this week. Oh great, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh good, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Ovary, ovary, ovary cyst next. I will add that to the list. Bye. All right. See you guys.